Hello, welcome to LinkedIn Live with Insight. You know, it's kind of like the fake piped in music with the real NFL games, don't you think, guys? That was exciting. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I'm going to kick every single meeting I ever do off again with that countdown. I thought they That's were a great idea. I thought they were starting Thursday night football a little bit early. <laughs> well, speaking of football, it feels like it is the fourth quarter. The clock is ticking, and it's time to make some great plays to come out ahead for 2020. Usually the fourth quarter is when a lot of organizations are thinking about their business strategies for next year. And if hindsight really is 2020, then what have we learned so far from the business response to COVID-19, among everything else that's happened this year? And what insights can we now leverage to find a path to victory? I'm Jillian Viner, and I'm thrilled to introduce you today to two gentlemen who know a thing or two about making strategic game time decisions. Please welcome Insights SVP of Digital Innovation, Stan LeQuinn, and SVP of GM of Connected Workforce, Mike Amond. Oh, there, I hit my desk just to wake everybody up. <laughs> Guys, we're so glad to have you on for our LinkedIn Live today. Um, I do want to let our viewers know that if you have any questions during today's conversation, go ahead and leave a comment and we'll do our best to answer them as we go. So again, if 2020 were a football game, I'd say we have a lot to analyze. So let's start first by reviewing the tapes. Looking back on the year, you know, what did organizations do? What were some heroic plays that we saw and where maybe were you know, some missteps happen. So let's go ahead and start with you, Mike. What went right? Yeah, I think it's been a really interesting year. There's a, uh, if you think use the highlight reel analogy from from football, there's been some some great highlights. So obviously the uh, big unexpected event of the year was the pandemic and, and all the ensuing mayhem that resulted from that. But when I think about some plays, uh, first, you know, look at what our frontline healthcare workers did. They responded to the call to action with grace and courage. And, you know, the number one play for me is that, and we owe them uh, a debt of gratitude. There's essential workers in a bunch of industries. So think of, you know, financial services, adopting digital technology to continue to provide essential banking services to keep our financial system going. Look at healthcare adopting uh, telemedicine so that they can continue to provide care to their patients. Uh, retail and restaurants adopting things like order online and curbside pickup. I mean, I thought it was really great to see. You know, that, those were things that would be on my highlight reel for uh, for the year. Stan, what about you? Yeah, Mike, Mike took some really good ones. I think it's just uh, as human beings, just how quickly we can adopt and, and persevere in, in the face of, um, you know, just, just unprecedented things. You know, we, we talked about the concept of the playbook, but when this hit, there really was no playbook. Um, and so, you know, I, I got a chance to participate in a bunch of thought leadership pretty early on and, and organizations talked about, like when you plan around business continuity, it's around losing certain components of your supply chain not your full supply chain, not full regions, not multiple regions. And so just perseverance and how we uh, rose up as human beings to, to deal with new challenges, uh, just absolutely incredible. Um, you know, and, and it's just like Mike said, there's heroes that are that come out of every single one of these types of events and think about drivers um, and, you know, handling the delivery components. You think about insight and what we do to provide um, IT and, and technology solutions to companies that were responding that were frontline and how we supported the front lines. Um, just uh, just incredible to see how we, as a society and as human beings, um, you know, came came uh, to, to take on just an incredible and unprecedented situation. I think that's a great yeah. point, Stan. When you have, you know, a huge amount of uncertainty, which was clearly created by the pandemic, that's when that adaptability and innovation is, is super important. And to see the way we responded as humans and as businesses was was actually pretty energizing. Any really specific business plays that you thought were just absolutely heroic this year? I mean, we saw a lot of acceleration of digital innovation, digital transformation. Um, you know, what are some great examples that businesses can kind of take and, and glean some inspiration from? Do you want to go first, Mike? Sure, I'll take it. I mean, you know, Stan said it well, there was no playbook. And if you think about, you know, the time when you have to call an audible at the line of scrimmage, this was it, if ever. And when I look at, you know, our economy at large, um, you know, the, the COVID really took hold in the US in March, in the March timeframe. And almost overnight, 80 million workers in the United States went remote, 
right? Almost every company in the U.S. said, if you don't have to be physically present to perform your job, please do it remotely. And what was interesting to me is that prior to COVID, a lot of leaders thought that most roles in their organization were not suited to remote work and it wouldn't be very effective to have their employees work remotely. And a lot of companies actually have been proven wrong. And a lot of us have been proven wrong and it's actually been really, really productive in a lot of cases. I spoke to an executive in the insurance industry just the other day. He said their leadership team was uh, very worried about when they sent everybody home to be remote that, that the productivity would just fall through the floor. And they actually saw the reverse. They've seen increased productivity and their leadership team has now become, you know, as opposed to a convert and, and they're proponents of working remote in the new model. And what's interesting to me is if you think about had this occurred just 10 or 15 years ago, it probably would have been a huge disaster because we didn't have the penetration of, you know, light devices like laptops and, and, and SaaS applications that employees could use. We didn't have the penetration of broadband security at home. We didn't have the digital collaboration suites we have today. Uh, we didn't have the security tools we have today. So a lot of the technology is what enabled us to, to weather this storm that wouldn't have been possible not very long ago. Yeah, absolutely. And it seems like a lot of companies having figured that out are gonna be kind of pressured to maintain some sort of flexibility. It sounds like companies that take a hard line on, on bringing everybody back to the office full time are really you know, potentially gonna see some turnover because of that. Do you think that this remote work environment is going to perjure and, and what that might look like in the future? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the best parts of my job is I get to spend a lot of time with clients and I'm con continually asking my clients, what does the new normal look like, you know, when you do return to work? And most of them haven't haven't yet returned. And there's an interesting pattern I'm seeing, and I'll use these percentages as rough percentages. They'll vary by company and by industry. But what I'm hearing uh, pretty consistently is maybe 25 percent of employees will work remotely full time from now on. So they will rarely, if ever, come into the office. And if they do, it's for a company-wide event or training or something like that. Maybe another 25% will return to on-site or in the office full-time, right? kind of the, the pre-COVID normal. And those are uh, specifically jobs that are very difficult to actually perform remotely. Right? So think of what many of the essential workers did during the pandemic. But what's interesting is this 50% in the middle. And what I'm hearing is, you know, organizations are going to have their people work two or three days a week remote and two or three days a week back on site or in the office. But there's a shift in the nature of work that goes with that. So we're seeing that individual contributor work will increasingly be done in the remote setting, not exclusively, but increasingly done there. And then people will come into the office for the areas where it really helps for them to collaborate and innovate with their teammates. Um, and that has a big implication to the office as well. So the office shifts away from being a, you know, a sea of cubes for individual contributors and becomes more of a collaboration hub. So I think that's what the new normal is going to look something like that. Yeah, Mike, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting. When everything first started, I know our business um, accelerated quite a bit around helping people with the remote aspects, right? So as you mentioned, um, you know, the um, business productivity components, you know, the collaboration components, um, uh, devices, right? Obviously a big thing there, security. And it seems like that is now switching to how do we create a great experience for those that are remote and those that are in the office? Because um, the tools need to change a little bit when you have, when you have meetings where, you know, maybe 50% is in the office and 50% is remote. Um, and so I know we're doing a lot of work around those tools. Um, you know, one of the things I've, that I think has been incredible with, with organizations is just, you know, we have um, a solution around uh, detection and prevention with uh, back to the office. And so it's allowing um, organizations to leverage IoT, and I'll talk about it um, at a high level, to bring people back into the office in a very safe way. And so the care that organizations are shown to their teammates, um, I think it's just absolutely incredible. Every client we talk to is it's, how do we return everyone safely? How do we make them feel really good about it? Um, and, and then how do we sort of change the modality of, you know, um, not only bringing people in, but how we create that collaboration between the, between, you know, people in the office and the remotely. And the things that companies are doing around back to the office um, is, is really leveraging IOT devices. And so at first it started with uh, thermal imaging 
um, and allowing us to look at temperatures, um, doing, you know, safe questionnaires at home that connect into what the CDC guidelines are associated with it. You know, you sort of pass the questionnaire. This is how our system works. You pass the questionnaire, you come in, you get a QR code, you show it up to a scanner, scanner checks your temperature and then uh, allows admittance. Um, but also doing things like, you know, contact tracing. And so we, our solution allows you to have a wearable and it uh, tracks people as they come in contact with folks. So if there is someone who tests positive, you can do all the contact tracing work automatically without having to go back and look at, at um, you know, video and those types of things. Um, and then all the really cool things that companies are doing around, you know, sanitation, hand sanitation, hand washing, um, our solutions hook into, for instance, uh, Gojo, Perel, um, to make sure that, you know, people are being smart about what they're doing around hand washing and other, other care to um, prevent continued outbreak. And so I think the care in which organizations are bringing their people safely back into the office, additionally, as how they're supporting the individual, um, you know, sort of work needs of the teammate and what works best between, uh, uh, you know, working remotely or working in the office. And then the flexibility they're giving teammates around that to me, it's just been absolutely incredible as we've kind of worked through this. So it's definitely yeah. a teammate first feel that, that I see with all the companies we're engaging with. And Absolutely. we've been able to experience that personally. So I'm actually in our uh, Tempe headquarters and we are back in the office at a maximum of 25% capacity. And we've actually implemented the solution that, that, Stan just, that Stan just spoke about. So I don't know if this will show, but I actually had, did the mobile application yeah. this morning. It asks you a handful of questions and our security won't let you in the building without that being fully filled out. Uh, we do have the passive uh, uh, RFID, or not RFID, uh, thermal uh, imaging cameras that allow uh, passive taking of the temperature. So my temperature was scanned before I came in. We have social distancing in the hallways, masks, one-way hallways, hand sanitizers, um, that we didn't really have at that level before. So it's really interesting to see how technology is actually enabling uh, not only the remote work, but the safe return uh, to the office. Yeah, and I think that kind of goes into one of our future topics here, which is talking about special teams. But before we move on, and I don't want to dwell on the negatives of, of 2020 or, or things that happened, you know, not the best way, but because it is important to kind of learn from our mistakes and understand the mistakes of others so that we don't make those same mistakes. I wonder if you could um, probably stand, because I know that you work a lot closer with, with our clients in the digital innovation space. You know, what were some of the moves that companies made to move to a more digital focused, digital centric um, position that maybe, you know, didn't think everything through or there was definitely room for improvement um, or where bringing an additional partner really helps to kind of see things from a holistic view? Yeah, I think there's a bunch of areas, right? I think what we found was um, if you had made big investments in data and AI already, um, you had a chance to capture quite a bit of market share and extend your lead. Um, and so a lot of organizations had to play a little bit of catch up there, right? So the ability to instantaneously analyze as things change within your supply chains, how that has to impact how you go to market, how you, um, you, know, how you drive your business forward. For companies that had a very robust capability around data and AI, um, they really capitalized on that opportunity. For those that didn't, they fell behind in market share and they had to play catch up. And so we've been doing a lot of work uh, really in the data and AI space uh, with our clients. Um, and it's not only concepts like, you know, I talked a little bit about, um, you know, ML models and, and using that from a, from a COVID detection and prevention, um, you know, around social distancing and occupancy counting and all that uh, from an AI perspective at the edge. But it was really just woven into all their products and services huge differentiator created a huge opportunity for organizations that made those investments. Additionally, agility and just how quickly you could respond and make changes. And so organizations that um, had developed cultures around things like DevOps, right, that allowed them to instantaneously make changes in their products and their solutions, um, had embraced modern application development software uh, culture, they had a lot of advantage in this because they could quickly respond to changes. And so um, we've seen that uh, we've seen that really play out. Uh, and we're doing just a tremendous amount of work with helping organizations really modernize how those how they bring products to market. And then um, the last one is really around contactless. And so the ability to engage with your um, uh, with your clients in a contactless way that they felt really safe, like Mike gave the example of curbside, and so there are organizations that made investments in, you know, modern devices to allow contactless um, scanning and, and those types of things. And so 
you know, we had organizations that, I mean, people were kind of like had scanners strapped to them, you know, computers strapped to their backs. Like it was crazy, their version of contactless to keep their business going. And they rapidly made the investments they needed to do to kind of get it to a point where they could continue. But one, just a ton of innovation that they figured out a way. I mean, it was almost like people walking around with long USB cords um, tethered to the store to do it. But but they they made those in investments and quickly um, you know sort of modernized their solutions to allow for it. But um, people that had made investments in data and AI, people who made, who made investments in modern ways of building products and solutions um, around software uh, development, they created a bigger expansion um, for those that didn't had uh, make those investments. Um, it was kind of a wake up call, and they had to make those investments. And so, really, the three biggest areas within my team is. Uh, cloud enablement around concepts of DevOps and modern software, data and AI, and the last one is IoT. Yeah, Great. Kind of similar, Mike, do you have anything to add? Yeah, similar story when you think about it from a workforce or end user perspective. There were companies that had invested ahead of the curve, and there were some that hadn't pre-pandemic. And in the end user world, that looks like um, they might have legacy premise-based management tools for their end user devices. So it requires the end user to be plugged into the corporate network in order for them to monitor, patch, upgrade, apply security to the device. Um, they might have had, many of them still had a lot of desktops uh, as opposed to a notebook, laptop, tablet that their employee could use. So the ones who had invested in modern cloud-based management tools that allow for zero touch deployment and provisioning and full remote management and full remote security and had broadly distributed laptops or tablets to their employee base were really well prepared and the actual transition to remote was quite easy for them. Those who had the traditional tools and maybe some of the traditional devices and management approaches uh, it was a much bigger challenge and caused a, a big, big scramble for them and, and big investments in a very short period of time that they typically hadn't planned for. But it's not too late, right? It's not. I mean, it's, this digital stuff is not going away. No, I think it's here to say. I think that's a safe bet. So let's move over to our next category. And I just want to remind viewers that if you have any questions during today's conversation, feel free to drop those in the chat. Again, we've got experts here from our digital innovation team and our country workforce team. So a very broad and deep uh, pool of expertise that we've got on hand. So let's talk about special teams. You know, this year through a lot of businesses, it wasn't just the need to accelerate transformation or figure out how to go digital. You know, we also had a really just dynamic cultural environment. You know, organizations had to come face to face with questions and conversations around diversity and inclusion. Um, it, was a, it was a tough political uh, atmosphere. Um, and then you had, you know, real environmental issues like companies experiencing wildfires nearby and, and heading into hurricane season. So just a lot for companies to take on and manage at all fronts. Um, so let's talk about the special teams that a company can pull together. What kind of resources and talent what do they need to assemble to make sure that, you know, each of these different challenges are addressed and handled appropriately? So, Mike, I'm going to kick it over to you first. Let's talk about first the, the workforce aspect of it, everybody going remote. What do you need to really support that, you know, adequately? You know, it's interesting. There's been a lot of discussion of the, the technical team and what they needed to do to support the remote workers. And I touched on some of that. There's been a lot of discussion of managers and how managers need to operate differently when their employees are remote. But I think one of the special teams that uh, is really, really needed is human resources and, and organizational development. And I say that because think about the challenge of building and sustaining culture when the vast majority of your or teammates are remote. Right. So there's there's some little things you can do. You can use video as we're doing today. And people sometimes were hesitant to do that when they're working remotely because maybe they didn't shave or they didn't do their hair or they're afraid that their kids or their spouse or their dogs were going to be in the video. Those are actually the things that humanize us to each other um, and build connections between us when, I, when I'm on a video with you and I see your, your children or your spouse or your, or your pets uh, in the screen. The other thing we've done is um, we've tried to create some non-work related touch points with the team. So I try to do twice a week, half an hour with my leadership team, 
just to see how things are going. Talk about last night's football game. Talk about what your kids are doing, you know, over the weekend or how remote school is going with the kids. And in many ways, by using video and creating some non-work touch points and employing some of those kinds of, of techniques, you start to replicate what naturally happens in the hallway that really isn't happening anymore. So I think, you know, human resources and organizational development, when you think about culture, is, you know, one of the critical special teams this year. Stan, what about from a digital animation perspective? You kind of touched on this with the work, or not work from home, but bringing people back to the office and creating that safe environment and the strategy behind that. Yeah, I, uh, you know, um, HR big, right? So, uh, you know, again, when there's no playbook and, and having experts in that area, um, additionally, uh, we've worked a lot with our legal teams on, you know, what's the right way to build out solutions and, and um, you know, protect, uh, our teammates, but also protect identity and other things that are very important to them, right? And so having teams that that understand, you know, that line and, and how to support um, the best interests of the teammates, but privacy and those types of things, um, we're really good at, at creating solutions and software and those types of things. But having that expertise, I think, has been huge for us, our, our operations team. So we operate very large warehouses and, and we do, as I mentioned, um, you know, uh, uh, supporting essential workers, uh, really critically, we kept those open. And so we just, I think we are best in, in class and the things that we built out on on how we work with our teammates, you know, the, the open exchange we have with our clients. And so we have a lot of working sessions where we talk mutually about what we're doing around um, back to the office and creating a safe environment, what best practices are. It's actually shaped a lot of the product that we, that we have built out. Um, our IP around our connected platform detection and prevention was based on what we had to do to support our teammates. Um, and so just having that team of experts outside of the technology area on HR and legal and operations and coming together, um, uh, you know, through like Mike said, video, et cetera, um, that's been absolutely uh, incredible. And then the other thing is just the share of ideas, you know, like organizations that are finding really cool ways to connect with their clients are very open about sharing what they're doing. And, and that's becoming a best practice for all of us. And so it's become really this kind of you know, social way that we're coming together as a society to say, how do we stay connected and how do we keep that connection? Because it's so important to us as human beings, right? We're social beings. And so, you know, making sure we have those connection points, I think is really important. Um, I know we're all a little fatigued on video, but um, but I think it's important. And there's all kinds of, you know, we're doing stuff with VR. Um, so my team's doing uh, VR meetings and um, for about, you know, 30 minutes to an hour, and then you get kind of a little headachey. But um, yeah, it's just fun. Like, you know, we had a VR meeting the other day and we were talking about, you know, how we're engaging with clients, et cetera. And it was around a basketball hoop and we're shooting virtual basketballs. And so I think there's just some really cool things that, that we can do. One of our immersive guys had built it out for us. Um, but I want to uh, be included on that. I'm bad at basketball, but I want to be in on that. Yeah, the hoop's like a million miles long. So we, you know, okay. we all felt like we were, we were all LeBron James. But um, <laughs> one of those cool ideas, I think, is, is, is really important. Yeah, invite me here. Awesome. Good bag in there. I, I will. I'm sure I'm going to get all kinds of asks to be included, but we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> that was some good humble bragging in there. I like all the IoT use cases, bringing different teams together. It's not just about the technology, but really bringing inputs from HR, from operations. I love that plays an important piece. You know, the other unfortunate side effect of everybody working remotely is obviously a huge increase in cyber attacks. You've really been hearing about it all year long. I haven't met anybody yet who doesn't know somebody whose company, you know, became a victim of some sort of cyber crime. So especially then towards the end of the year, budgets might be getting a little bit tight. Maybe people feel like their security is okay. Um, you know, what advice would you give there as we continue to endure kind of a remote or dispersed operations? Yeah. Um, I was waiting for you to jump in, Mike, and then it was like awkwardly silent. And so I was like, I'll jump in. Um, <laughs> you know, I think the flip there. side is um, I've had 47 calls today that, um, they're going to take care of all my student loan debt. And so that is awesome. And so I think it's not only, uh, I think it's not only um, as, as corporations, right. As, as individuals, we just got to be super diligent. And so um, organizations, I, I think it starts with education. Um, and so, uh, you know, bringing in, um, you know, consultancy and other organizations that can talk to you about what best practices are, what they're seeing out there, what are the type of responses that they're having. I think that's really where it starts is education and 
Um, and that education, it's, it's twofold. It's not only in, in how we responsibly use the assets we have at work, but also personal assets because it's, I mean, I get six calls a day, right? It's, it's, um, it's, it's everywhere. And then how we work with our families on, on doing the right things around that. Um, but the, you know, the tools, um, uh, and the capabilities that, that we can bring to clients around, you know, leveraging AI and, and threat detection, right? Um, I mean, there's a, just an amazing suite of tools. And when you think of the cost of not doing what you need to do around security, it's going to far outweigh um, any investments you're going to make in security. And so I think you got to prioritize it up. I think it's something that organizations kind of look at it and go, hey, it's okay for now. Um, it's okay until it's not okay. And when it's not okay, it's really not okay. I mean, you know, there's ransomware that's happening that's crippling businesses for months, um, you know, where we're encrypting hard drives and everything else associated with it. And so I think being diligent is really important, understanding you have um, more people working remotely and therefore you have more exposure points. Um, you know, the training is a big part of it, but just an amazing suite of tools and capabilities that partner like partners like Insight have that we can really help you sort of take that to the next level. Mike? Yeah, I mean, Julian, you're right on. The surface area for attacks in the remote world has just increased exponentially. So there's a there's a few things companies can do. One, that it seems very obvious, but in many cases, and I read reports that said, well, a, a solid majority of employees didn't even have security enabled on their home Wi-Fi network. So starting with some real basics, like making sure your employees have enabled Wi-Fi adopting cloud-based security tools that allow you to do monitoring and, and prevention and patching remotely while your employees are dispersed is really, really critical because those the attacks change on almost a daily basis. Looking at uh, companies are looking at things like kind of home-based SD-WAN gateways to allow you to segregate corporate and personal use. They're looking at technologies like VDI to reduce and help manage uh, manage security as well. And the last thing, you know, our IT organization does this is we do a lot of training, for example, on phishing attacks, but we actually do simulations. So they send out a simulation. You've gotten them, uh, Julian. Hopefully, you didn't click on the link. I got it. Right. I did well, it. I I claimed awesome. it. But they but they test us and they and they report it out to all the leaders of you know how many people are in your organization and how many people clicked on the link, um, you know we have north of ten thousand employees so it's a near certainty that if if it, an email goes out to ten thousand employees somebody's going to click on it, so we did a lot of training around that to help employees really be able to easily recognize. Um, uh, a, a spam or a phishing expedition, even if it's fairly well disguised. So there are a set of things you have to do, but you have to be really, really vigilant about it in today's world. I've gotten very personal uh, requests from our CEO, Ken Lamnick, you know, wanting to reach out to me individually to help him out with something. Yeah. They get really clever. And they look pretty authentic. They do sometimes, yes. So as we wrap things up again, this feels like the fourth quarter of, of everything, the year, the game, you know, there, there's just a lot of strategy that has to happen to make sure that we're all positioned for a really strong end of year and then heading into 2021, feeling really confident about the direction of where things are going. I know both of you have tons of advice, but as we kind of close out our LinkedIn live session today, give me your best coaching advice. What can companies or what should they be thinking about as they create their goals and their um, strategies for 2021? Um, Stan, let's start with you. Yeah, I, I think the the big thing is um, we there will be an endpoint, right? And I know there's uncertainty in the endpoint, um, you know. And I know we've looked at we talked to a bunch of analysts, all all of us have, right? And and they're thinking, you know, Q three, Q four, is it a hockey stick? Is it you know, is it V shaped? Is it you know? Everyone's kind of working through that, but there is going to be this recovery point and setting yourself up to take advantage and capture market share and create disruption in your industries through the use of technology, uh, now's the time to make the investments, right? So when you invest now, you can yield much bigger um, opportunity and dividends of those uh, on those investments um, as we start to come out of this. And so it's, it's reimagining your business from a digital perspective, um, looking at what you think those opportunities can be that you can capture, what are new markets you can enter into, et cetera. Uh, Cause there's going to be a tremendous amount of opportunity that, that comes out of this. I think the other component of it too is uh, invest in people. I mean, now's a, um, a great time. I mean, we're continuing to go out and get the best possible talent. And I think there's a, a huge opportunity around talent. I think the geographic borders 
are removed a bit with talent. And so I think there's ability to get talent everywhere um, and uh, and uh, leverage it nationally. And uh, and so I think those things are really changing the way how we're going to engage with the clients. And so reimagining your business um, post pandemic, um, I think is really important. And then uh, making those investments are going to capitalize on on which which should be a great opportunity. It's hard, right? Yeah. I mean, it's been it's been a hard it's been a hard three quarters, right? And and um, and we know it's going to continue for some time in the near future. Um, but position yourselves for that for that rebound, I think, is really critical. And sometimes the biggest challenges really spark the the greatest room for opportunity to get creative, right? Because you really, I mean, you guys said it. You had to throw out the playbook. There was no playbook for this year, so it was kind of like let's just try something wildly different and see if it works. Well, and, and Mike talked about this. I mean, when we went into it, I, we had a saying, and we had two sayings in, within our team, right? Which is, um, one, we're going to come out of this uh, four times stronger than we went into it. And because you got to execute with absolute perfection to win here. And Mike talked about productivity and everything going up. I think that's part of, you know, just people have just figured out ways to, to work better and more efficiently than they ever have. And so I'm excited with, the uh, you know, muscle memory built up over this time to see what happens uh, when some of those barriers are, are removed. And I think that's, you know, sort of the first message. And the second message is, is um, it's in service to, to our clients, right? It's, it's not, we don't want to sell our clients. We want to serve our clients. We understand everyone is just having, um, you know, different in different ways, different challenges, but we're all in this together. And we talked about how we came together as, as human beings and, and as society. And, and so it's being in that service to your clients, right? Continue to see how you can help them uh, through their individual challenges and, and help them position. And I think those are really the things that are exciting. I think everyone's take that sort of mindset of, we're going to get so operationally efficient. We're going to execute better than we ever have. Things are four times as hard as they've been in the past to get the same results. And so when you start to remove these barriers, uh, I'm just excited of what's going to happen. Love it. And how about you, Mike? What's your best coaching advice for 2021? Yeah, um, it's kind of where you started the conversation, which is what does the new world of work look like? And uh, we call it the hybrid workplace. So my advice is embrace the hybrid workplace. And I would characterize it with by kind of three elements. First, the dispersed workforce. So I talked about that, where this blend of full-time remote, full-time back in the office on site, and, and, and a big chunk in the middle. Um, but as Stan said, that, that allows a company to have access to talent they didn't have before because geographic restrictions are reduced. It allows them to reduce their facilities footprint and potentially save some costs. And it provides both professional and personal flexibility to your, to your workforce. So in embracing as opposed to fighting that dispersed workforce is one, one key shift. The second is digital engagement, building on what uh, Stan spoke about. So if you think, you know, pre-COVID, we all employed digital engagement. So mobile applications, kiosks, and other types of digital self-service, primarily as a convenience. But in COVID, to prov pro provide for social distancing and prevent the, the spread of the virus, digital engagement shifted from convenience to necessity. So we saw things like the growth of telemedicine and healthcare. We saw uh, digital banking exploding. We saw um, digital collaborations. Food. Yeah, Microsoft saw 700% growth in the adoption of Teams in about a six week period. Right? I mean, that's phen a phenomenal, phenomenal growth rate. So, and the digital engagement's not gonna go away post COVID, right? So these new models are here to, say, to stay. And then the third element is the consumption economy. So the consumption economy or consumption models are all about enabling access to assets or capabilities as opposed to having to own assets or capabilities. So think about our personal lives, right? We use Spotify to provide access to digital music so we don't have to own a physical CD. We use Uber or Lyft to provide access to a car so we don't have to own an automobile in tech that manifests itself in things like software as a service and infrastructure as a service clearly these were underway before covid and growing quite rapidly they got dramatically amplified by covid so we're actually seeing some of the big analysts like gartner and, and forrester advise their clients to accelerate their adoption of consumption models for two reasons one is 
again, in the high economic uncertainty that we live in, you minimize that upfront cash flow and, and spread your costs over time. So you're changing CapEx to OpEx. So that, that's one big benefit. The second big benefit, and, and Stan alluded to this earlier, right, in, the, in times of uncertainty, you really need to be able to adapt quickly and adopt new models. And what a consumption model does is let you very quickly adapt up and down or ramp up and down to changes in, in the levels of volume and capacity that you need in your business. So that's kind of what I, you know, how I think about 2021. I love it. Uh, definitely the the click and receive economy and culture is definitely here to stay. You know, a lot of the adjustments that were made to be digital really helps build up the convenience economy. You know, I mean, how can you name name five items that you can't buy online and, and receive, whether it's a service or a product? So it's pretty amazing. One really interesting example of that, we have a, a company that manufactures hearing aids. And as you would imagine, they're, they're customer base is skewed pretty senior and they wanted to go into the audiologist and make a physical visit when they had to you know get their hearing aid adjusted even though there was a digital model available to do that well covid they're also the most subject to covid or one of the high risk groups to covid so they couldn't go into the audiologist and they kind of got forced and figured out that oh i can actually call the audiologist on my mobile phone tell them I'm hearing a ringing in, in my uh, hearing aid and the audiologist can remotely adjust the hearing aid and get it correct and take care of the whole thing. So you had a, an audience that was probably not very receptive to digital engagement that has now embraced it and likely won't go back. Yeah, we're seeing that with telehealth too all over. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the one thing that I could not get online is sheetrock. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to fix like a sort of a big, you know, big area of a wall and sheetrock, but everything else you can get online. You have to go to the store to pick up the sheetrocks there? Yeah, the sheetrock is, uh, you can't get that online. It makes sense, right? I mean, but I was shocked. I checked all the places one gets things online and I was shocked that I could not get sheetrock. <laughs> so that's the answer to your question, Jillian, sheetrock. <laughs> thanks, thanks for coming me on. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time today. And I know that you provided a lot, lot more information and insights in the featured story of our latest tech journal. It's the fall issue. So for our audience out there, if you want to learn more about, you know, the perspectives of what happened in 2020, some other great, great inspiration and stories of businesses that, you know, really played out some great recoveries. Um, and then, uh, you know, further advice, we've got quotes and, and coaching advice from other CEOs and CXOs from different companies. Um, partners of ours, as well as clients. You can check all of that out at insight.com slash tech journal and get full access there. Gentlemen, thank you again so much for your time today. Thank it was you. so great thank to have you. you on. Thank you, Jillian. Fabulous job. Jillian, thanks everyone who tuned in. It was, it was, uh, it was fun. Thanks. <laughs> we should do it again. Disrupted. Challenged. It's time to rewrite the playbook for business and IT. The fall issue of the Tech Journal delivers coaching advice from industry leaders and critical plays to help organizations rise up and come out ahead. Key plays like strategies for a hybrid workforce, defensive plays against security threats, and smart procurement maneuvers. View the latest issue and start your free subscription at insight.com slash techjournal.